As you listen, keep in mind that though this podcast features medical and other professionals and regularly speaks on the topic of psychoactive substances in a positive light, nothing heard here should ever be taken as medical advice or as encouragement to consume any of the substances mentioned, especially the ones that are blatantly illegal in your country of residence. Listen critically and always check in with yourself before acting based on anything you hear or read on the internet. everyone welcome to yet another episode of at mine radio i am your host as always james w gesso now before we get into this podcast i want to throw a little tidbit out there to everyone which is that i have recently started a patreon page which uh, is kind of like crowdfunding except instead of it crowdfunding a major project it crowdfunds uh, small amounts each month from independent people who would then accumulate to a point wherein uh, it is paying for things like the hosting or the upgrading of quality of this podcast, the articles and stuff that I write. So it's really a question of whether or not you feel like you're in a place where you'd like to donate something small like one or two dollars a month towards supporting me in my journey of producing, uh, you know, what I do around Adventures to the Mind and my essays and articles. Now I've selected it to be uh, per month rather than per podcast or per article because I feel as though if it's per month, then it enables me to focus and give my fullest to each thing rather than per item, wherein there might be an unconscious uh, or or even unfortunately controllingly subconscious push to put out more rather than higher quality. So that's why I've selected with going with something like per month. Anyways, check it out. You could go to bit.ly slash uh, at mind support or head over to jameswgesso.com. And under the At Mind Radio podcast menu at the top, just click support. Um, otherwise, just continue to enjoy these podcasts as much as you can. So starting off with the official interview here, I would like to welcome Stephen Gray. Stephen has been a lifelong student, teacher, and researcher of spiritual plants, in particular Tibetan Buddhism and the peyote ceremonies of the Native American church. He has studied and practiced several other modalities in the healing and awakening fields and also devoted much time and love to music as a teacher, singer-songwriter, and composer of music for healing and spiritual work under the artist's name, Kiri. Returning to the Sacred World is his first book, and Stephen has also written uh, several feature articles for leading magazines in the field. He's also the co-organizer and uh, curator for a conference that has come up several times over the last few podcasts, which is the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, and is the author of an upcoming book called Cannabis Spirituality. Is that correct, Stephen? Cannabis and Spirituality. Cannabis and Spirituality. So uh, on that note, welcome to the show, Stephen. Sure. A very minor correction. There's no the in returning to sacred world. I don't know how that crept in there. Just returning to sacred world is the title of the first book. Interesting. Yeah. Probably just crept into the need for me to just create things as sounding as lyrical flow as I'm reading them yeah. Uh, out loud. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Right, so Stephen, uh, how, did you, how did you get into uh, this relationship you have now with what you call spiritual plants? And can you kind of outline what, what that means? There's, are there certain types of plants that are more spiritual than others? And are you referring to a specific um, uh, classification of plant? Can you go into that a bit, please? Sure. Well, those are, sound like several questions. I'm, I don't know how much to give you here. Um, I, the, the first part of your question was, 
how I uh, got into some kind of relationship with them. And uh, uh, <clears throat> this, this one I'll have a hard time keeping brief, but I'll try. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm 66 years old, so I come from the baby boom generation. But more importantly, in my mind anyway, uh, it was a period uh, that uh, re was referred to as a countercultural generation. There were a lot of people that were uh, sort of counter the existing culture of the time. And I was very sympathetic to that. Uh, worldview. Um, uh, in the late uh, 1960s and early 1970s, uh, there was an explosion of interest in, in these more alternative uh, crowds, so to speak, uh, in um, spirituality, particularly Eastern Asian spirituality, like Buddhism, Hinduism, Zen Buddhism, that kind of thing. And at the same time, not coincidentally at all, uh, there was an explosion of interest in, in the psychedelics. LSD being the primary uh, substance uh, for most people uh, in terms of accessibility at the time, but uh, we were aware of other plants. Um, as you're well aware, there's this notion of set and setting being very important for um, spiritual understanding or benefit from these plants. And uh, that was not well understood in general at the time. But uh, And a lot of people use them. I think a lot of people probably still do. Uh, but certainly at that time, we didn't know anything much or hardly anybody knew anything about the sort of uh, ancient indigenous use of these plants that is much better known now if one cares to find out. Um, uh, so, you know, people were taking them in any old situation. Uh, however, little spiritual insights tended to leak through anyway. And that caught my attention because I was always interested in the spiritual side of things, just the nature of who I am as a person. Um, so um, it kind of stuck there. But then uh, what happened to a lot of us at that time was in the 70s, this, this kind of meme started to come through. Um, I think it was uh, Alan Watts who was quoted as saying, um, when you get the message, hang up the phone. And... Uh, and he was referring to the psychedelics in that sense, you know. So uh, what happened for a lot of people was <clears throat> they thought, okay, so I've had the I've had some kind of glimpse of uh, you know divine truth or reality or whatever. But how do I bring that into my actual life? And uh, for a lot of us that 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 were interested in the spiritual aspect of it, that meant pursuing some sort of spiritual path that had practices involved. And for me, that was Tibetan Buddhism. So I got involved with Tibetan Buddhism, left the psychedelics out of it because they weren't interested, um, until I bumped into the information coming from uh, Terence McKenna, who in the late 80s put those two back together for me. Ah, yes, you know, there's this, you know, ancient traditions of uh, indigenous people using these plants for spiritual reasons. And uh, I could make it long or short, but basically that led to various connections. I got involved with the Native American church with peyote ceremonies, uh, started working with ayahuasca occasionally, um, and one thing led to another. Eventually I wrote this book that you mentioned earlier, Returning to Sacred World. That opened a few more doors, got involved with the conference, and on and on and on. Current, uh, lately I've actually been involved with the Santo Daime people here. It wasn't something that I was really interested in pursuing. It didn't seem like I, I wasn't really that interested in going that way. But uh, I knew that they worked with cannabis, some of them anyway. And when I was working on the book Cannabis and Spirituality, I was curious about how they used it. So I made contact with uh, somebody from the local group here, the director actually, and he invited me to come along to one of their ceremonies and I ended up really liking it. So. I've been to about 10 of those in the last year or so now. So that's kind of uh, the sort of uh, biographical summary of my connection to the plants. And when then your other question is, you know, which plants? Um, well, I, I don't know, uh, you know, entheogens is another word for them, right? Psychedelics meaning, psychedelic means mind manifesting. There are certain class of plants and semi-synthetic substances uh, that seem to have the potential to, uh, as McKenna put it, dissolve the ego and open one up to what Buddhists might call unconditional reality, um, and certainly have great potential for healing the wounds that people have as well. So uh, I could say a lot more, but maybe you'd like to ask another question or lead it somewhere. 
Yeah, so you had mentioned LSD being the the primary catalyst for uh, for the psychedelic culture of the 60s. So then I would assume that the first psychedelic that you tried at that time was LSD? It was. Cannabis Can- first, though, if you want to include it as a sort of a maybe minor entheogen, which I consider it an entheogen, but, but LSD was the first. Yeah, definitely. So what I'm curious about is... It- I don't personally get to have a lot of conversations with people who were um, dialed into that culture at that time and still continue to look upon it with a clear view set and how it has contributed to who they are as a person now. So I'm wondering what the cultural atmosphere was like for you uh, leading up to the first time you took LSD, how old you were, and what that initial experience offered you uh, at that time. I'm not sure I remember my initial experience, to be honest, or which one which one it was. Um, I, I think I was always interested in something other than what was going on in my culture, too, you know, in the mainstream culture. Uh, I mean, it's kind of still like that, but uh, at the time, um, anything sort of other than, <laughs> you know, the world of my parents and the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, you know, cosmology of the... 50s and 60s. You know, you got to remember that in uh, the Western world, in North America in particular, perhaps the 1950s were kind of what I would consider the nadir of Western civilization. You know, uh, 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 Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, was once asked what he thought of Western civilization, and he said, "I think it would be a good idea." <laughs> um, so, you know, the 50s was this kind of uh, the man. You know, novels like The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit. You know, and uh, sort of button down uh, conformism and so on. And then our generation, it was just a combination. I think there's some, there was something almost inevitable about it. You know, it was like the kind of in the stars. Of, you know, but, you know, there was this huge glut of people, you know, in a short period of time that were born in between 1945 and roughly 1955, but especially 45 to 50, you know, all the soldiers coming home and, you know, six years of uh, no nookie, um, all of a sudden, you know, a baby boom. And so a combination of factors, the button downness of the 50s, the sort of stress and struggle that, you know, the, of the previous several decades, you know, they'd had a war in the teens, and then they, in the 30s, they had this horrible depression, and then they went right into a war, and then they came out of that, you know, quite wounded, you know, sort of almost on the planetary level in some ways. And then our generation came along and for whatever combination of reasons, there was this explosion of, of like, wait a minute, there's something really empty about this material. Oh, there was a very strong materialist focus that came out of that time too, right? You know, the poverty and struggles of those earlier parts of the century led to, uh, for whatever recombination of reasons, seemed to lead to uh, a focus on security, and safety, financial, material security, right? So along came the 60s, and there'd been this period of 20 years by the mid-60s, 20 years of no war in this part of the world, and an uh, incredible increase in material wealth. And then our generation came along, and we had all this stuff. It was easy to get a part-time job in those days in the summer. College wasn't expensive. Um, There were a whole combination of factors, but but, a lot of us started going, wait a minute, there's something really empty at the core of this materialist culture. So all these things happen to come along at the same time for whatever combination of reasons, the um, access to Eastern spirituality, access to the psychedelics, and so on. So for me, um, I guess I, you know, all of us maybe intuitively understood that these things were going to shake up your reality. And I kind of put it off for a year or two while a couple of friends around me were exploring LSD. But then I finally did, and Oh, actually, I do remember my first one, and uh, it's probably uh, an example of how important set and setting is, because if there had been someone to guide me there, I might have had something, you know, they say with ayahuasca, they say the first one's a freebie, sometimes they say that, you know, and uh, I I was scared shitless by what happened in in that first one. There was no attention to set and setting, it was just... I was in college, Um, a guy that I knew uh, told me he had some acid, I was welcome to come and do it at his place, so I went over to his place on a Saturday night, 
he was there with his wife and their like I don't know one year old or two year old baby in a small apartment. And the wife was in the kitchen with the kid, and I was in the living room with the guy. And uh, I took this acid. They didn't take any. It was just me sitting there. They were just having a normal family night. And um, two really amazing things happened. Uh, one was um, uh, they were playing George Harrison's My Sweet Lord. I don't know if you know that song. My Sweet Lord, Hallelujah very spiritual song from the time. And um, I, two things happened at the same time. I suddenly realized there was no time. Everything was happening now. Um, and the other thing that happened was there was a black space opened up above my head. And that's what scared me. It was like it wanted to take me in there. But I didn't know enough about you know what that would have meant um, or you know, how to negotiate that or anything. It just scared the shit out of me. Mm -hmm. So I remember turning to the guy beside me and saying, uh, tell me who I am. Like, you know, what's my name? You know, like, give me an identity, you know, because it was trying to steal my identity, so to speak, and take me out of my illusory little self somehow. But I didn't understand that was where I was supposed to go. So it just scared me. And um, so he, you know, he kind of patted me on the knee and said, yeah, you're okay. And I kind of calmed down and got back into the quote-unquote real world there. Um, so that was my first experience. But I, I've had, uh, I had at that time, I had some uh, couple of really, several, you know, we used to like doing it in nature. We used to like doing acid in nature, and those were amazing, you know, really connecting with nature. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, and then I had a couple, I had a, I guess what you'd call an ego death experience one time with acid. So it just always uh, remained with me as a possibility. And as I said, it was McKenna that kind of, you know, brought the two components, so to speak, you know, medicines or psychedelics and uh, existing traditions of spirituality that really knew how to work with these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you're... When you oh, I seem to oh, be getting an echo yeah. here. Oh, I haven't done anything different. It could just it be could just the, the glitching glitch. of Skype. Good old Skype. I'm going to edit this out once it's... No, it's it's fixed. Okay. So okay. as you were telling me this story that you, you look up over at your friend and you say, um, tell me about who I am, I couldn't help but get a, a the image of, um, of uh, Johnny Depp playing um, Hunter S. Thompson in the casino where he's watching all the lizards like do the crazy stuff and he just leans over to his friends and grabs him and goes tell me about the fucking golf shoes <laughs> not to like make joke of your experience but like the sense yeah. of all of a sudden being brought into a space where it's like whoa that other person around me is in a totally different reality than i am and i just went somewhere completely different whoa you know it's just like coming back to this moment of like i need to reach out to to um, to be acknowledged that everything's still okay. Yeah, the real uh, is my ego identity, basically. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you said that you had some time with the Native American Church. Now, a lot of the people that I have talked with throughout the podcast and throughout the course of um, of my, I guess, like psychedelic relationship slash career, uh, most of it is a focus on tryptamines. I haven't met a lot of people who have done a lot of work with. Um, peyote, especially in a structured context. Can you offer a little story about um, what your relationship had been to that, how you got into it, where you went with it, and where it sits in your life now? Hmm. Well, um, sure. Um, with reference to uh, your earlier question about, you know, differences or similarities between the medicines, they all have their own character. You know, when I say they, I mean, the ones I'm familiar with are psilocybin mushrooms, ayahuasca, peyote, LSD, and, you know, primarily. Um, I've done San Pedro once, but nothing really happened, so I can't say much about that. Um, uh, so they all have their kind of their own style, I guess. But um, uh, I guess the really most important thing about, about those plants is um, their potential for inviting one into reality, you know. To things as they are, um, into truth, 
And uh, peyote is <clears throat> really interesting. I, let's let's compare. Let me compare it to ayahuasca. Okay. And ayahuasca, not for everybody, but uh, tends to be very visual. You know, um, some people refer to it as this kind of a celestial kind of a plant. You know. Um, and uh, and my experience with psilocybin is it tends to be very visual as well. Um, peyote could be, but um, the way it's done in the Native American church, for one thing, most people keep their eyes open most of the time because it's not individual work. The individual work or benefit that um, uh, derives from it is kind of like a, a byproduct, um, a, you know, a, a side benefit, so to speak, of paying attention to what's going on because those ceremonies are prayer ceremonies. So when one is called, with some variations, but almost always uh, a meeting happens because somebody asked for it and they asked for it for a reason. And that person is then called the sponsor for that meeting and they take a particular place in the circle and they're called upon to express why they've called that meeting and then they ask the uh, congregation, as it were, to pray for that purpose through most of the night until about three or four in the morning when things change and people are invited to pray for their own uh, family, friends, self, and so on. But they really are prayer meetings and the songs that they have, um, the kind of chant-like songs that they use, uh, continue through most of the night. Um, and they're sung by everybody, basically, or whoever knows them. The, they're instruments that are passed around and when they come to you, if you know the songs, if you know any songs, you sing a set of four. Um, and anyone else who knows that song is welcome to join in. So those songs carry the prayer for the night, uh, basically. So, um, and you sit upright and you pay attention. And you can close your eyes and drift off a little if you want, but I, most people didn't. And I didn't feel like I really wanted to because there's things going on. There's sometimes people moving around you. Maybe the person beside you is about to throw up, they, what they call getting well. Um, they do, they call it getting well. And maybe you need to help that person or maybe, um, uh, you know, anything. There's a number of things that could happen. So it, it feels like you need to pay attention. And by paying attention, um, I mean, I struggled with it a lot just, you know, because I'm sensitive and, you know, there's ego and blah, blah, all these things. And, and uh, but, you know, when I could get my mind into the right place, um, they say, you know, Watch out for head traffic, like get out of your head and just pay attention. And um, ideally what can happen um, uh, is that, uh, you know, you open up to it. And I see peyote in particular as a heart medicine. I don't know how to compare that really to ayahuasca. Um, it's very um, kind of purely about opening your heart in some ways um, and the wisdom that comes from that. Like ideally, you just drop into your heart, you drop into a place of uh, peacefulness, you know, peace, um, where things become still in the inner sense, right? And uh, I've certainly had glimpses of that in those peyote ceremonies. They're really beautiful ceremonies. I love them. I, I just kind of haven't really gone much in the last, I went, I probably went to 35 or 40 of them in about a 12 year period. And just for the last couple of years, I haven't gone a couple of the key players died and a couple of other factors happened, um, uh, but they're really beautiful, powerful ceremonies. You know. One guy that used to lead a lot of the ceremonies, guy that died about three, four years ago, uh, Ken Littlefish, you know, he used to say things like, like one morning, for example, uh, when they talk in the, mor in the morning, when the dawn comes, they tend to express themselves more. You know, the, the major part of the work is kind of coming, easing down by then. And uh, uh, that particular meeting, there were probably about 40, 50 people there. There were about six or seven people who had never been to a meeting before, new people. And the meetings, by the way, were a mix of uh, natives and non-natives um, in, in, the, in the environment where I was, maybe half and half a lot of the time. Anyway, there were about half a dozen new people. And uh, Ken uh, looked around the teepee and said, you know, you new people here, <clears throat> you're probably wondering what happened last night. He said, um, it probably doesn't matter on some level if I tell you because you've got to find it out for yourself, but I'll tell you anyway. What you experienced last night was reality, right? And another way that he put it one night or one morning was, uh, 
He said, um, relatives, this, meet, this medicine wants to meet you, but it can only meet you from where it is. And you can make that meeting hard or you can make that meeting easy. Um, and that's to me what the medicines offer. And that's what the Santo Daime people seem to be pretty good at actually is creating a container you know, as long as you don't have a conceptual problem with some of the Christian overlay, and I don't, actually, um, what, uh, what it offers is a, a, a light, clear, clean container where you become aware of your relationship to, you know, truth or reality or whatever you want to call it. You know, God, the divine, unconditioned reality. And um, so that to me is what's going on is that you know, that's that's the core of teachings like Buddhism and others is that there is something called unconditioned reality, awakened heart reality, and we're all in some relationship to that. And what the medicines are is sometimes referred to as uh, non-specific amplifiers. So when, so that's where set and setting become so important, right? When you, uh, when you're, um, when your kind of mind body is ready for it, so to speak, and there's a container that keeps it focused, you know, there's a lot of talk that you would be familiar with, James, about um, the um, participation of the actual spirit or spirits, you know, of those plants, you know. Um, uh, I, I'm pretty sure. I'm, my, my connection to the spirits of the plants, I'd say it's kind of, um, how would you put it, a little more amorphous or um, kind of somewhat subtle and almost more at the intuitive level. But, you know, some of the elders from the Native American church, for example, the same guy, Ken Littlefish, he said, you know, when I'm running these meetings, the spirit talks to me, and I mean it literally. He said, you know, they'll, they'll say, you know, you see that person over there, Ken? You need to pray for him right now, or you need to go over and bring him some extra medicine because he's struggling with something, you know? Um, so to me, it's, there's reality. It's what Buddhists call unconditional reality or enlightenment or whatever you want to call it. It's reality, and what the medicines can do in the right circumstances right set and setting, or the best sets and settings, um, is uh, um, amplify that potential, channel that potential. Mm. So what led you to writing your first book, uh, Return, Returning to the Sacred World? Was that right? Yeah, without the the. <laughs> right. Um, what, uh, what led you to writing that book, and what's, what's the premise? I don't know. It could have been self-importance. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, sorry, I'll get serious here again. Um, <clears throat> well, really, it was just, uh, you know, I've always been a, a teacher. That's, I just am. I'm a, a teacher, communicator, kind of by nature, you know. I used to teach elementary school music. Um, and I was doing some teaching in the Buddhist uh, community as well. And I've just always wanted to express to other people, share with other people what I think I've understood or or channeled or distilled, as it were, you know. Um, so that was, um, you know, kind of the cumulative at that point, um, result of, uh, I don't know, 40, 45 years, uh, on the spiritual path, so to speak. Right. Um, so I just shared people with people what I thought I understood or had understood through my reading and experience and, you know, listening and paying attention and all that stuff, distilling that all. So the book kind of had three three sections. It, uh, the first section was kind of a worldview thing, like, you know, how we've become spiritually disconnected as a species and a little bit of history on that, some of the, you know, unbalancing that's come about in our in our planetary, you know, kind of mind, mind world, you know. And the second section was um, some more suggestions about how to work with that, uh, you know, more con more specific concepts. And the third section, the th final third of the book, was kind of Medicines 101. And it was kind of an introduction to three or four of the major medicines, major psychedelic or sacramental medicines, uh, like peyote, ayahuasca, psilocybin, with some my less lesser references to some of the others, like LSD and so on. So, that, yeah. Um, yeah, that's the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. So the most recent book you've been working on is Cannabis and Spirituality. Right. I think, uh, I mean, this is this is a, a situation that befalls on more than just cannabis, but in particular I see it quite strong with cannabis, which is uh, a loss of sacred tradition and then 
an abundance of of cultural use. So, uh, like ayahuasca, peyote, these things don't really fall so much into that category because they've come in to the Western mind uh, from a place of still being deeply seated uh, in their cultural traditions, where things like psilocybin mushrooms have been, uh, you know, quite significantly emancipated from those traditions and the majority of their use uh, within within our culture, and cannabis even more so. I mean, cannabis itself, uh, its culture is a worldwide culture and looks totally different in every place that it's been found since uh, since the dawn of agriculture itself, cannabis has uh, has been a part of human society. And one of the things that I think is is really missing is the sense of having reverence for these substances, for these plants in our lives, and in particular cannabis, because we get a lot of talk these days now about the medicinal model, you know, it being a medicine for a variety of things, which, I mean, the evidence very obviously points to it being so, even if people from, high-level people from the DEA might, um, might have other more ignorant views. But um, we get that tip and then we get the tip of enabling people the idea of having the recreational use and such but there's a lot of talk about cannabis as being a as being a a spiritual plant even for myself i often though when i think about it i would include it i often don't include it when i think about psychedelic or visionary plants but it is it it does have some potent qualities to it as a as as your terms as a, a spiritual plant can you talk about uh, can you talk about cannabis and, and how you hold it in yourself, like what you perceive of as that medicine and why you're being called to write this book? Well, basically, you've already said it. I don't think I need to say any more. <laughs> I'm kidding, but you, you nailed it already, which is just what you said. That uh, um, I mean, the, the, this plant has a... Uh, um, it's almost the most num- it's almost the number one plant for human beings in some respects because of all all the uses that it has. It's been with us since time immemorial and it's been on the planet estimates range from 35 to 90 million years for the Cannabaceae lineage, you know. Um, uh, it's been there since the dawn of of, of civilizations. Um, uh, you know, everybody finds the plants in their neighborhood and p- cannabis has been in the neighborhood, you know. They figured out, you know, I mean you, you talk to the you know, the elders from the Amazon, and they know every single plant from their neighborhood, right? They know whether it's good for medicine, for clothing, for food, you know, for poisoning their arrows, whatever. Um, so, you know, cannabis always would have been found and uh, always would have, was used everywhere. Um, and it has this, um, uh, as you could find out by reading, say, for example, Chris Bennett, you know, who's got a, books like Green gold, green gold, the tree of life, and cannabis and the soma solution. Um, done extensive research. There's an ex- there's a huge, vast history of the use of this planet for all purposes. This plant, sorry, um, but um, in this case or in this context, it's a spiritual ally. And as you quite correctly pointed out a few moments ago, that has fallen on hard times. You know, particularly in the 20th century, um, that understanding, that aspect of the potential of cannabis. So that's the purpose of the book: is to reclaim that, rehonor that, point out to people that uh, when you use it, you know, as I've been talking about this notion of set and setting. You know, if if you if if your mindset, your intention, your attitude, your preparation, um, and the setting that you do it in, whether that be a private ceremony with yourself or with other people but with an intention for it and reverence you know you, you know you you understand this obviously james you know you know i, I really like the way you put it you. you know there's a, a loss of reverence you know for for cannabis in particular because it's so accessible and it's so there you know um i like to th- refer to it as the people's plant that's one of the beautiful things about it is when we can really learn how to use it properly it's our plant like no other plant is, you know. Um, you don't need, I mean, it can be helpful. Some of the contributors to my book believe that it can be helpful to have a guide. Um, but you don't need a guide in the same way that a lot of people would feel they would need a guide with ayahuasca, for example, or peyote or some of the other substances. You, it's, it's, it's a kind ally. You know, it can be really powerful, but it's also a kind 
and flexible and accommodating ally. And you can do your own private work with it, you know, without having somebody there to direct it or something other than yourself. It's truly the people's plant in that way. And again, the purpose of the book uh, is to, um, that was the genesis of the book. The inspiration for the book was to, uh, you know, was in recognizing that just as you yourself also put it, that it's, it's sort of, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. Um, but very few people seem to really understand that if you sit down, shut up, and pay attention, to quote Terence McKenna, um, uh, this plant can open you up in a very powerful way, both gentle and powerful way. In fact, it can be really powerful, but if you open up to it, it has a gentle quality off, usually. Um, um, although, one of the reasons that I do include it, include it in the entheogenic pantheon is that uh, in strong doses, um, it can be as strong as as uh, as anything, really, you know, or just about anything. I've it, never faced my my uh, the quote unquote reality of my own death as strongly as I have when I've had too much cannabis edibles. That's for sure. Edibles, that's the thing, right? You know, I've got a book sitting on my shelf up here called Orgies of the Hemp Eaters. It's a collection of writings from the last several centuries, mostly from the Orient. And, uh, you know, the Brits were in India for a long time, and there was a lot of cannabis in India. And so a lot of them were adventurous and tried it and wrote about it. And a lot of that was edibles, you know, drinking, you know, bong lassies or whatever. And they had no idea what they were doing with dosage. And so some of them had these incredibly over-the-top experiences where they wrote about them. You know, they're bizarre. Or, you know, are you familiar with the Hash Club of France, the, the Club de Hashish? Nope. Oh, that's a kind of a classic, actually. It's a little book by Théophile Gautier, um, a group of, um, in the 1850s, I think, a group of um, intellectuals and literary figures, some of them quite well-known, uh, Baudelaire, Charles Baudelaire um, was one of them, uh, met in the home of a rich friend of theirs. Uh, I don't know how often, once a week, once a month, I forget. Um, and they had hashish from... Uh, hashish paste from the Middle East, um, and they would eat, have this dinner together, and then they'd plop a ball of that hashish paste into their coffee and uh, drink it down and then kind of go off into different parts of this mansion. And the descriptions are, um, you know, kind of bizarre. Like one guy, you know, was left alone in the living room and there was a fire going and there were gargoyles coming out of the fire, you know. Another guy tried to go up the central staircase and he said it, not not metaphorically, but literally felt like it took him a thousand years. He literally felt like it was it took him a thousand years to get up these fifteen steps or whatever. Um, so you know, in strong doses, it can have really, really bizarre and powerful effects. I'm not sure. You know, with uh, some of the other psychedelics or entheogens, if you channel that energy, you know, there can be this powerful ego dissolving spiritual opening. I'm not sure if cannabis does that, and I, I don't play with it at those levels, you know. Um, uh, so I'm not sure how much of those kind of, when it gets really bizarre, you know, perceptual distortions, you know, up the yin-yang. One guy talked about, in that book, talked about uh, he's lying on a bed and his family are around him, and he thinks he's having the most unbelievably bizarre physical experiences where a sound sounds like an explosion, um, he moves his thumb half an inch and he thinks he's just, I don't know, done this dramatic gesture. But everything was heightened and exaggerated a thousand or a million fold with this experience. So, but does that lead people to spiritual insight? I'm not quite sure. I think it takes a lot of good set and setting for that uh, with cannabis. It may be different from some of the other um, entheogens that way. One of the themes in the book, actually, that I didn't, kind of lead the way on, but there's 17 contributors to this book. And uh, as I started bringing in or collecting all their essays, their chapters, I started seeing there was a repeated theme with a number of them, which is, could be simply put, less is more. It is, um, you don't have to do it. In fact, it, it becomes, um, there's a tolerance effect for most people if you do it too much, too often. But also, if you really pay attention, if you sit down, if you can silence your mind for a period of time, it doesn't take a lot to put you into this kind of space of um, being really centered, really present, you know, open-hearted and still, inner stillness, you know. 
it has that potential, and it's very much a spiritual ally from that point of view, as I understand it. So, um, yeah, I did it really sloppily a lot when I was younger, like many people, you know. Um, uh, but uh, more and more in recent years, um, I don't do it socially, uh, rarely, very rarely. Um, uh, I'm more likely to do it alone uh, or in a ceremonial context with other people. Um, or uh, actually a friend of mine and I uh, jam, play music together, and we use it for that, but we also make it into a little ceremony. We start with a little three-gong thing, you know, and um, make dedications and prayers and sit in silence for five or ten minutes before we have a puff or two, and then we sit for another ten minutes, and then we play some music, and then we check back into that wellspring periodically. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I use it these days. Mm. Yeah, within your um, your paradigm, your 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 viewpoint of cannabis as as this uh, plant with such beautiful spiritual potential, how do you how do you see what might be called widespread cannabis abuse amongst the using culture? I see it as widespread cannabis abuse. <laughs> so, what, what, where does it where where do you perceive that it, it comes from? Like, why? I mean, this is kind of a big question. I'm not really sure where it's going, but I, I just want to ask you, which is that um, what do you see as the significance of cannabis abuse? Hmm. Um, well, I, I guess it comes back to intention again, right? You know, um, two of the contributors to the book, well, they're actually, I interviewed them. Um, they're Iboga shamans, and they use Iboga... I mean, they use cannabis in their work when they're actually preparing for and leading ceremonies. And uh, one of them said, the plant wants to know what you want to do with it, right? It wants to know how you, it, it's, an, it, it's, it's, as I mentioned this phrase earlier, nonspecific amplifiers. I see it as similar to the other entheogens in that regard, that um, it amplifies, it energizes, and it's how you channel that, right? So, um they they use the plant as as uh, one of them said um, it uh, it's like looking through a window it opens up a window where they can see things that they couldn't otherwise see or connect to when they're working with people in the sh in the ceremonies so they have a very specific intention right they're not just doing it to get high so it's are you using it like <laughs> phrase that comes to mind is there's no there there you know there's no place other than who we are and our relationship to spirit that's ever going to give us any solutions, answers uh, that uh, heal our lives. So uh, cannabis can be used. It's an extremely gracious plant. Uh, un, you know, you're not going to use ayahuasca every day, right? You're not going to use it to escape with. It just ain't going to happen, right? But cannabis, yes, you can use it for escape. She's fine. She, she, you know, she doesn't judge. If you want to you want to misuse her, you go right ahead. And if you're using her every day, it can be to uh, it can be. I'm not saying it always is by any stretch. Some people use it, I think, wisely as a kind of a rebalancing medicine in their lives. You know, I know people like that. Um, it kind of takes the edge off things, and that kind of person sometimes needs a bit of that. But um, you can use it to avoid your responsibilities to yourself to other people. Um, you can use it to numb your feelings, the sharpness of your emotions. Basically, you can use it as an escape. And a lot of people do use it that way. Um, and that's, I guess, I don't know what to say about that exactly. It's, it's certainly not understanding what the plant is capable of. Um, it's a re when, you, when you're um, working with it uh, effectively and wisely, it's a relationship. You know, that's where the reverence that you talked about comes in, right? You know, you revere this as a... One of the stories from the Santo Daime uh, world, uh, one of the uh, early founders of the tradition in Brazil, um, <clears throat> this is, I like this story. Um, it's kind of a, I don't know, a good metaphor in a way. Um, back in the 70s, he had a community in the jungle of uh, people working uh, with ayahuasca in the Santo Daime religion way of doing it. But they didn't, for whatever reason, they didn't have cannabis around. 
Um, but then in the 70s, the, the, the hippie backpacker types and all these kind of people started exploring out into you know all parts of the world. And one of those areas was coming out into the Brazilian jungle. Excuse me. And uh, so somebody showed up at his door, this guy's door one day with some cannabis. And uh, you know, he kind of said, well, I got this you know, plant here, you know, and I'm not quite sure what to do with it, you know, if I'm going to do ceremonies with you guys. And the elder said, well, well, give it to me and I'll check it out. So he went and did a little kind of private ceremony with it. And he came back and said, well, I had a vision with this plant of a woman in a garden. And she was tending her garden and she had these various plants. And she took me over and she showed me the cannabis plant. She said, here, this is part of my garden. This is one of my plants. She, because of the Santo Daimes thing with the Christian overlay, he called it uh, the Virgin Mary or Mother Mary. But he also said Mother Mary is also Mother Earth or Pachamama. Mm -hmm. So it's a plant that belongs to the, plant, the, the planet, to the, to the Earth spirits. And what she told this guy was, if you want to take this responsibility on, your task would be to reclaim this plant from misuse and misunderstanding it and return it to its proper mistress. You know, it's a holy plant. It's a sacred herb. You know, you hear the Rastafarians talk about that a lot, too, you know, that it can in introduce one to universal consciousness. So um, if people use it, it, it really comes down to being aware in your own life of what you're doing. You know, it's the same for everybody. And no matter whether cannabis is involved or alcohol or no substance at all, what are you doing in your life? You know, if you, know, you want to escape from your life, that's what you're doing, you know. If you want to heal your life, then um, may, maybe you need to pay attention, you know. Maybe you need to meditate. Maybe you do, need to do some healing work. Maybe you need to uh, um, start thinking about using cannabis, you know, with more reverence and more care. Mm -hmm. Or taking a step back from using cannabis at all. Or using it at all, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the Native American people that I knew in the peyote, peyote uh, way, they generally did not like cannabis at all. And the reason, as far as I can uh, ascertain, is because the people that were using it, because most, most um, I mean, we're all wounded, right? You know, you were at the conference, you heard Gabor Mate talk about that. Mm -hmm. We're all addicted to something. Um, we're all addicts. Um, uh, but the Native American people, as you probably know, you know, have had the shit kicked out of them for the last 300 years or so. And... Uh, and they had their cultures completely stripped away from them and left with nothing. So they're pretty deeply wounded people for the most part. And um, so, um, you know, escapism from that wound, that's what Gabor Mate was talking about. Everybody wants to escape from that pain, right? And whether you do it through obsessive work or, you know, overeating or sex or gambling or substance abuse, we're all trying to get away from spirit in a sense or who we are and uh and um the native american people had it really bad and so cannabis was part of that for most for a lot of those people and that's what the people in the peyote the native american church saw was that the people that were using cannabis they were using all the substances and they were using them to escape themselves and avoid dealing looking after their their families and you know all that shit so they they never liked it at all um i forgot what the question was <laughs> i don't even answering a question anymore no it's great uh i want to i want to jump back to this story that you told about um uh the the um santo daime practitioner having this vision and this thing that you said about if you want to work with her you have to reclaim her and i like to think about how much the way we speak about things is a reflection of how we feel about them and though not this is not a cure-all, but if we start to become conscious of how we communicate about things, we can start to, through conscious control of our communication, change the way we feel about things. And one of the things that I come up uh, against quite often is people who will just very um, immediately call cannabis marijuana, right? And that to me, this kind of just came out of my mouth one day. I think actually I had smoked some cannabis and someone said marijuana. And I just looked at that person and said, hey, that's her slave name. Speak to her with some respect. And there is a significant history to be said about why cannabis is illegal in the first place and how much the term marijuana, which was originally a slang term used by um, 
American uh, Hispanic people to talk about their use of that plant, which was then utilized with racism to demonize it and trick the people into giving up their sovereignty over a plant that was rather prolific in, uh, in cultures all across the world, but specifically across the Americas. And, uh, and I, I really appreciate how in this conversation, there, there wasn't until this moment any mention of marijuana, because that's not what we were talking about. We we're talking about this other plant. Um, I, I, that's not really a question. I just, I just think that uh, it's maybe a, a suggestion to, um, to the people who are listening, if they're looking to transform their relationship to this plant, to just think about different ways of, of referring to it. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm completely there with you on that one, too. In fact, I made a reference to that in my book. Um, I had a little, um, <clears throat> I don't know if the publishers are going to let me leave it in or not, but right, right after the introduction, I got a little chapter called 10 Frequently Used Terms. Um, and one of them is, uh, you know, cannabis versus marijuana. Um, and I don't like the word marijuana because I am aware of that history. Uh, its genesis seems to be mid-19th century, and it seems to be classist and racist, both toward Mexicans and black people in the United States. Um, and it was used and kind of uh, uh, taken over by people like Harry J. Anslinger in the 1930s, uh, Federal Bureau of Narcotics or whatever, you know, that were, when they were seriously demonizing it um, back then. Um, uh, I don't like the word particularly. I mean, you know, one doesn't want to get too fussy about the words in a way because it's so commonly used and not necessarily in a disrespectful way, of course, it's just because it's become part of the culture. It's a word that's sort of almost broken loose from its etymological, etymological history in that sense. Um, but I prefer not to use it generally. Um, uh, whereas cannabis... And you know, can easily con you can easily confirm this, uh, you know, with, through the work of Chris Bennett or some of these other historical scholars. The word itself goes back at least to ancient Greece. Uh, uh, cannabis, almost the same word, like spelt with a K and some other letters that not spelled exactly the same way, and cannabosum, and there's all these etymological uh, uh, precedents for the word cannabis. So there's something um, honorable about using the word cannabis in my mind. And the other word I like, um, actually, is Santa Maria, uh, which is what the Santo Daime people call it. Um, uh, Saint Mary, right? Uh, this is that little anecdote about the guy saying, you know, your job, if you choose to accept it, is to uh, reclaim this plan and return it to its proper mistress. So I believe he was the person who coined the term. Uh, back in the 70s, uh, called it, started calling it St. Mary or Santa Maria. Um, I like that one. It's a reminder that it comes from, you know, please, let's forget about all the overlay of Christianity. Who cares on some level? You know, yes, the Christian church has been a big fuck up, but um, <laughs> for the most part, sorry, Christians. But, uh, <laughs> uh, the historical power structure of the Christian church has probably done a lot more harm than good. Uh, but there are spirits, there are archetypes that are self-existing that have nothing to do with that on some level. And so St. Mary is the same as saying Mother, Virgin Mary is the same as saying Mother Mary, is the same as saying Mother Earth, is the same as saying Pachamama, you know, if you accept that language. So thinking of it as a holy plant or a sacred herb, the way the Rastafarians do, anything that reminds you that it's a, a sacred herb, Probably a good way to think about it, right? Mm -hmm. you know? So I'm with you on that one. I, I prefer not to use the word marijuana generally. So tying this, um, tying this, this interview here uh, into closure, is there anything in particular you'd like to lis offer the listening audience in regards to if someone is curious about deepening their potential with cannabis as a as a as a spirit ally, or just wanting to learn wanting to learn more about transforming the relationship uh, with it, what would you suggest? Well, if you can't wait on a year for my book to come out, <laughs> then uh, it's not something I could really do justice to really briefly. But I'll I'll try to give it a little nutshell thing here. Um, dosages is is, is important. Um, if you're not really that familiar with the plant. I would say start small, you know, with a light dose, especially if you're talking about working with strong, contemporary, commercially grown cannabis. Um, start with a light dose and just sit down 
you know, meditate with it. Uh, it'd be great if everybody knew some simple follow the breath meditation techniques, you know. The thing about cannabis is for a lot of people it tends to stimulate ideation. You know, it's, it's talked about a lot as, as a creative stimulant, and I think that's fantastic. I also use it that way. Um, but it has this potential. If it, it, it has to do, I mean, this is like a basic core spiritual concept or principle, which is that reality happens in the gap between our thoughts, right? Buddhist, and Buddhist teachings talk about that so much. You know, the, you know, there's a phrase, I can't remember in the context of it, it's a, your head garland of non-thought, you know. Um, uh, emptying the mind, being, being able to uh, empty the mind and be 100% there without, you know, the overlay and the compulsive thinking of the busy mind opens gateways, opens doorways. And because it's an amplifier um, uh, and a gracious plant that way, as I say, if you can sit down, even for five or ten minutes, you know, even give it five or ten minutes of your time when you're getting high, um, to just sit, you know, and practice meditation, and practice paying attention to your breath, practice paying attention to your body, um, then you may find that it really opens things up for you. You, you can really do that. Um, I would say... Um, Learn about the strains as well, because different strains have different effects. You know, many people know now that there's a sort of a continuum from sativa at one end to, you know, the, the indica and sativa are actually two different plants, but most of what people encounter now are hybrids, but they balance more toward one direction or the other. Um, uh, myself and a number of people prefer to use the hybrids that lean somewhat more toward the sativa side because of their sort of sharpness. But other people may find that um, that stimulates too much ideation and they can't really control it. Um, I find indicas a bit too dozy and heavy. They're sometimes referred to as sleep, you know, sleep assistance, you know, um, soporific, drowsy inducing, couch lock, you know, is all associated with the indica side of things. Pain relief, you know, is usually uh, um, the more likely to prescribe an indica. Um, but other people seem to think that there's a relaxing, less busy mind potential with indicas. So work with that, you know. And then from my point of view, if you want to go deeper with it, uh, the, you know, the, the optimal dosage, if you want to try to explore deeper spaces with cannabis, is how much you can handle and still stay present without being captivated by the compulsive thinking mind. You know, it's not that you have to be empty-minded all the time, and you won't be. You know, hardly anybody would be. But... Um, but uh, if you can't allow any space in the thinking mind, then you're missing out on probably the deepest, most powerful potential of what this plant can do in terms of entering you into, uh, you know, non-egoic, non-thought space, so to speak. And in there is not only insight and wisdom, but also healing, spiritual and physical, same thing on some level, but it actually heals the body. It's a body medicine. It's an energy medicine. If you can pay attention to it and let it relax you, yeah, people like it because it does relax them. So you don't have to pay attention to it to let it relax you, depending on the person. But if you can pay attention to it while you're letting it relax you, then a lot more good stuff can happen. So, you know, I could say way more about it, of course, but you know, you, you wanted to wrap it up, and that's maybe a little nutshell on it. I'd say give it as much space as possible. Do it reverentially as much as possible. Do it simply uh, when stuff comes up in your mind, at least for a little bit of time. You know, like you, if you're a creative person, you go, oh, there's a fantastic idea. I need to pursue that idea. Some of the time you're working with cannabis, let the idea go, you know, and just come back to being in your body with your breath in the space you're in and just see where that can go. Cool. Well, thank you very much for uh, offering uh, your time here today, Stephen. Is there any links or contact details that you would like to offer um, us here? Yeah, I've got a website for this. Um, it's just very simple to remember, cannabisandspirituality.com. And um, there's a Facebook group I'd really like people to connect with. Uh, um, I really hope to uh, be part of a conversation uh, on this issue. Um, so the, the uh, Facebook group is also called Cannabis and Spirituality. So there are two easy things to remember. Um, uh, so, yeah, that. Great. Uh, so again, thank you very much, Stephen, and uh, I hope you have yourself a wonderful night.
Thanks, and uh, good chatting with you. Uh, you're a good interviewer, James. Um, yeah. And uh, you understand things in a good way so that you can you know, bring in interesting points and uh, ask relevant questions. And then let the person spin their web for a while. Appreciate that. Hmm. Thank you for that acknowledgement, Stephen. Yeah. As to the listening audience, thank you for listening to uh, yet another episode of At Mind Radio. If you liked what you heard here, please check out the links that Stephen just offered. You could also uh, head over to iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever RSS feed you're you're uh, attached to with your uh, podcast listening device, and subscribe, leave uh, comments and ratings on iTunes, very supportive. And uh, you can also, like mentioned at the beginning, uh, support this podcast by heading to my Patreon page, at um, bit.ly slash um, at mind support and uh, yeah have yourself an absolutely wonderful night thank you bye hey everyone james here this podcast and all of my writing is a passion project and brought to you by well you if you believe in the value of what i'm offering there's a few ways to support such as following me on social media like Twitter or YouTube, or even just by telling a friend. Word of mouth goes a long way. If you really like what I'm offering and want to bring your support to the next level, please consider donating to the podcast via PayPal or Patreon, or you could buy a copy of one of my books. Head over to jameswdesso.com support to find out more details. And thanks. If it wasn't for you, I couldn't do what I do.